Welcome to the Art of Marketing Operations, a Taylor podcast. Here you can grow your knowledge about marketing operations, listen to ideas and strategies to help you scale, grow, and optimize your efficiency, drive your speed to market, and enrich your work life. Let's get to it. Welcome to the Art of Marketing Operations, a Taylor podcast. I'm Glenn Bottomley, and today my guest is Matthew Guerreri, Chief Marketing Officer at Medical Guardian, a one-stop provider of senior health services and emergency medical alert solutions providing 24-7 monitoring of fall alert systems at home or on the go. Thanks for joining me today, Matthew. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Well, let's kick off with something that I know you and I both have in common, and that is that we both love self-improvement. Uh, you know, books and podcasts and TED Talks and, you know, all sorts of sources to better ourselves and, you know, increase our knowledge and expand our understanding of the world. So, Matthew, where did this passion come from in your life? Yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to say where it originated. Um, I, I just know that I've always been two things in life uh, ever since I was young. I've, I've always been curious about everything. Anything I see, I've always asked questions, trying to find out more about what that thing is, how it works. And I've always had the ability to uh, be a chameleon. And I think maybe that comes with some of my emotional intelligence, but I just uh, have connected with people inside of, you know, I was always an athlete growing up. So inside of the athletic group, um, with the artsy people, cause I was always a really good drawer. Um, it just really connected with every every single group, and it allowed me the ability to kind of see the pros and cons of not only uh, the groups, but the how they act, um, their strengths, their weaknesses, and then internally it made me realize where my strengths and weaknesses lied. And I've always been a person who really tries to attack just my strengths and just make them make them better. Not necessarily too much focus on the weakness, but that being said. Um, I do want to be and always have wanted to be more well-rounded and um, try to approach it as I can always get better. Um, maybe I'm not trying to be the expert at it, but I can always be better in some way. Uh, and it helps my understanding of others when I do so. Yeah, it builds empathy and and, uh, and so forth. I agree with you. I I absolutely love learning. Uh, I'm, I just, I'm a continuous learner, <clears throat> love reading, love studying, love research, uh, just just like you. It's, it's fascinating. I just, I'm very curious, just like yourself. And um, one of the reasons why I love doing this podcast, it's <laughs> you just meet really fascinating people, what makes them tick and what do they enjoy doing and, and why and, and how the world works. So uh, I love it too. So that's great. Yeah, we had a really great conversation to start off with about all this stuff. We we connected on all those things, which is great to hear. Exactly, exactly. Well, and you know, in one current self improvement topic that I know that you and I have both been studying lately uh, is around focus and deep thinking. And you know, and we were sharing some of our uh, some of our favorite recent books: uh, Indistractable, uh, Deep Work. Uh, you know, methods like the Pomodoro technique and many others, uh, there's this just growing body of research on focus, how to increase your focus, how to keep your focus, how not to, you know, fall prey to the just the dizzying number of, you know, distractions that we, you know, we face every day on the internet, our phones, you know, notifications, etc. So what are some of the most useful recent techniques that you've incorporated in your life to help maximize, you know, your own focus? Yeah, and to add to the list, I actually just um, finished Atomic Habits, uh, which it seems like after I'm looking uh, uh, through the world of marketing that it's a pretty, it's almost a staple of um, kind of habit forming. But um, for me, it's been really about consistency. Uh, I've, I've lacked this uh, growing up. It's just having a consistent um, nature about myself, the sleep and wake window routine. So going to sleep at nine o'clock, waking up at 4 a.m. and trying to do the workout, um, you know, keeping that consistency and making sure if I accidentally skip one day, I'm in right you know, the, the very next day, or if, if I can't get to it at 4 a.m., making sure it's 4.30 or 5, just doing something and not breaking that habit is really important to me. Um, 
reducing clutter and indistractable was uh, was very prominent in that topic which is you know put your phone on silent turn off your notifications your desktop should be clean and bare uh, when working you should only have one topic up at a time make sure you're focused on the task um, making sure when you get into your emails that it's decluttered you have a, a place to put where you want to answer today's emails the urgent ones where you want to enter you know the the rest of the week so just having some organization and sticking to that organization i think you can go crazy trying to figure out you know how every other person organizes there's just so many ways and men and methodologies to do so but i think the key is just finding what you feel is your your best way to do it for you and then just don't break from habit don't try to do something new every day just do that thing every day that helps you be productive and effective in your job and and that's kind of what i've been trying to trying to use i use some tools for automation it could be tricky when you start automating things it gets too complex and so i, I just try to keep it simple um and organized. Yeah, I uh, I'm the same way. I remember, you know, I don't know how many years ago it was. Uh, uh, don't sleep with your smartphone. Uh, it was, I think that was the name of the book. It was a Harvard Business Review book. But uh, but you know, I remember the the first time that I you know read that it was like okay, just turning off all notifications on my phone and, you know, and then putting, you know, your phone on airplane mode or keeping your phone in your bag or, you know, d d doing these things where it's like, you, it just narrows the temptation, uh, for, for distraction. And, and it just, it, it's sort of like every time that you're narrowing the, that, um, risk of, of, uh, distraction, it allows you to go deeper uh, deeper in your thinking, deeper in the work that you're doing. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm right along with you there in terms of, uh, and then the, the, your comments about habits too, uh, James Clear, the, for that book, it's, you know, it's, it's it, the, the repetition, uh, you know, in keeping in that, that flow, uh, it helps your mind and there's, it's almost a, a meditative state <laughs> that you can get into, but, uh, I think that's great. So I appreciate the, the, the recent recommendations. That's great. Yeah, we've all felt that flow, right? We've all felt that when you get out of it, you're like, oh, that was very productive. Yes. That's the that's what everyone's trying to get into. Exactly, exactly. I've heard people call it the flow. I've heard people call it the zone. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, whatever that is, uh, whatever it is for you and whatever it takes to get into that, uh, it just allows you to go just so much deeper and uh, and just really you know succeed at, at whatever that is that you're doing. Um, Absolutely. And so now let's talk a bit about success because I, I know that you've mentioned and you talked a bit about it just now is that, you know, you are a sponge and you show interest in everything. And so that mindset that you're talking about. So you obviously, I'm guessing you incorporate that mindset both at work and at home. Um, so can you just comment on a little bit more about if somebody doesn't feel that they have that sense that they're a sponge today, um, but they're intrigued by what they're learning from you here, how can they, you know, sort of, uh, acquire those traits? What are some of the recommendations that you could give? That's a really great question. Uh I think everyone has a passion to do something. Um, I don't. I don't know as if you have to really go all out and say, you know, I w I really want. I think the best people are the people who know what they're passionate about and follow that thing, and then become curious. And a lot of people just say, I want to. I want to be passionate in growing vegetables in my backyard. I want to be passionate in, um, you know, being the best at being organized. And then they try to do too much, or they try to do it all at once, and then they get to. They, they get they back off of it because it becomes frustrating that they can't get it done. Um, the people who usually are the best at things are just focused on the category, the specific thing they really want to be good at, and they just continue to focus there. So I would say find the thing that first, find the thing that you're truly passionate about. And with that, you got to experience all things. So I would I would say don't be afraid uh, to experience. Uh, kind of be like the yes man. And just try new things. Try different topics. Uh, I, you know, I have design books. I have organization books. I have project management books. Some of the things I've read full. Some of them I've read, you know, half of the way through. I'm like, uh, not, not going to be my specialty. That's for sure. But I enjoyed reading about it. So I'd say find that thing. Focus on finding that thing, and then really just. Once you become immersed in it, once you love it so much, it just becomes natural that you want to learn more, that you want to keep engaging. 
Um, I would even say that is what it's like for me at Medical Guardian. Ever since I started, I have just always been infatuated, infatuated with the audience, the fact that it's helping somebody and that it's protecting somebody's life. The thing that I'm doing every day is benefiting. And so that's why I just get deeper and deeper and deeper into it and have such a, uh, a mission and a beacon for wanting to be at a certain place at a, a certain time just because I love it. So I'd, I'd say find the thing you love and, and really and double down on, on that and try to learn more about it. Oh, that's well said. Well said. I had, uh, when I was uh, in my early uh, uh, academic pursuits for as I was finishing up my uh, PhD, I had a, uh, a faculty member tell me, uh, they said, don't read promiscuously. And I just, I've, all, I've always remembered that phrase, don't read promiscuously. And the point was, <clears throat> there's so much out there to learn that, to your point, I've done the same. I'll start a book, I'll read two, three chapters in, and I'm like, okay, I've got it, I'll skim the rest and, you know, you know either give away the book or return to the library or whatever. And, um, but also, you know, it, it is this notion of, because there is so much to learn, you want to focus in on those sources that can mean the most to you, that you can extract the most value uh, out of it. And if you're not getting value on it, you're reading your one chapter in and you're like, um, yeah, I'm not sure I'm not feeling this. It's OK. You know, re return the book, you know, g give it back, give it to someone, donate it, um, something and then move to the next one uh, where you can find that passion. So I, I love that. I think that's that's really salient advice. So thanks for that. Yeah, we've always we've all had that lean in moment, right? Mm -hmm. Which is in the movie in a movie you see a really good movie you love, you just feel connected to it. Not that, that it's action packed or like but you feel some kind of connection. You lean forward a little bit. That's the same with how I treat reading. Like I I don't even realize I'm reading anymore. I just am I'm like flipping through the pages because I love it so much. Same thing. I, yeah. I don't read promiscuously, promiscuously. That's very good. Yeah, it's great. Well, and I know that you also have the heart of an entrepreneur. And I, I remember when we chatted before, you had this great reminder that, that you shared with me that I love. And I just wanted to talk about it a little bit further here because you said that every time that you 3X something, it becomes more difficult to manage it in the way that you had previously done. So for example, like when you 3X the number of employees, you are gonna have to you know, likely make more foundational changes to support your entire employee base. If you say 3X your sales, you're gonna have to change how you onboard or service those sales, et cetera. So yep. what has been sort of the greatest lesson that you've learned about how you identify exactly what you're going to need to change when something does grow 3x. Yeah, it's a it's a constant struggle. It is not easy. I think uh, it's a it's a the key is to not be afraid afraid of failure. Actually, to approach uh, and and embrace failure. Um, my my biggest recommendation for that would just be. Uh, because you're going to fail. You don't know, especially for me, I haven't experienced this this type of growth. I haven't been in a startup company that has, this is my first first, first go at it. So I'm getting everything real time. And uh, the only way that I've been able to learn on how to adapt and change is through getting it in the first place and um, realizing where my failures were because I failed a lot. Um, as we started to grow into the 300s was the biggest gap. There was a board that I had to communicate with. There was a budget process. There's new hires being brought in after our acquisition of Medscope where I had to figure out they're, they're coming from more corporate positions. I had to figure out how to be more process oriented because in the startup, you're just going. You need something, here you go. If you want to talk to IT and get it done, done. It's it's done the next day. In a 300-person company, it's, all right, submit a ticket, and we'll get to that in a week. you got to prioritize your projects. So the biggest lesson I've learned through that process, I would say, is be extremely priority-driven. It can at, at that level, it cannot all be completed. It just can't. Um, you have to pick the things that are meaningful and not just the, that you feel are important. They have to have real business value that you've laid out and can show to a group of lead, upper leadership, uh, upper upper management that here's how it's going to get done. Here's the results it's going to drive. And then you got to prove it. So you better be very confident that's the fact and do your research. Um, I, 
uh, am fortunate to belong to the CMO group. Um, and I bounce all of my ideas off of them. They've all been through it before. So I learn from people who have done it in the past. I try not to make the same mistakes as they have by tapping them and say, what mistakes have you learned similar to what we're doing here? And, um, I think that's it, that everything that keeps coming through is just priorities. Mm -hmm. Priority keeps being the buzzword for me is just know exactly where you're going, have a strategy, have a one to three to five year strategy, even have a 30 to 60 to 90 day quarterly strategy. Uh, we do OKRs. We've established OKRs at Medical Guardian. So um, what are those big, hairy objectives and, and what are the results that are going to get us there? So I think that's probably my best advice for someone who's in, in maybe like the, the zero to 50 person group, uh, employee group base that is starting to get there. That's excellent. Really great advice. Uh, and you know, you've talked about that, uh, the business lesson there about priorities, uh, priorities and prioritization. And I have found that it's, uh, it, it is a, it's a constant, that process alone, a prioritization is ongoing. You know, it is to your point, there's, you know, something that was important last quarter reprioritizes. Now maybe it's number two on the list or three, and then it pop, pops back up to number one the next quarter or what have you. And so maintaining that sense of flexibility uh, and being uh, sort of comfortable with that change and comfortable with ambiguity and, and so forth, I think is, re is really key as well. Uh, and, and so, you know, Matthew, you've started from your career, I, I know that you were talking a bit about the success and this lesson that you've learned about, you know, hey, it's it's one thing to just ha say that this is important because there's a gut feel to it, as opposed to actually having a business justification as to why you feel uh, or believe that. So you started your career working in digital marketing, and then you progressed up to director of marketing, and then you were vice president of marketing, and, and now you're a chief marketing officer. So this has been a, obviously a, just a wonderful career path for you. So in addition to that lesson that you just mentioned, are there other sort of really valuable lessons that you've gained along the way? A ton. Yeah, a ton. Um, I would say that just uh, upon the, the, the curiosity portion of it, that the learning never stops. Um, at all levels, you are constantly learning new things. There's no way to not be learning new things. And if you're, if you, don't believe you're learning new things and I would suggest you try to figure out what's going wrong that you, you know, you've hit a kind of a stalemate because every day should be something that you learn new, either about people or about the business or about the direction that you're going or the different departments and something that they're doing. So I would say never stop learning. Um, the biggest thing and the thing that, um, I'm fortunate enough because I have such an amazing mentor and CEO in Jeff Gross, who I've been with since 2013. Um, he is honestly the beacon of uh, putting people first. And so I just see it, how it reverberates across the business is the employees. He meets all of them. He makes sure he has lunch with them. He knows all of their names. At Christmas time, he handwrites all of our partners notes and send it to him. And time and time again, all these things, all these personal touches um, that he puts on the people first mentality has just come back to little things. If we've been struggling, they're willing to help out. There's just always been something how that's impacted the growth of our company. He's met people and different partnerships through it. Just So I would say put people first um, and spend time building those bonds with them. Um, I think that you'll see classic across every book uh, about business, uh, especially self-improvement books, is uh, failure drives progress. Um, so I think per my previous statements is, you know, don't be afraid to fail, embrace failure, learn from failure, and then just don't do it again or try not to do it again as you go forward. Um, find your strengths early and nurture those strengths. I think in a, in a at this level of business, people lean on the strengths being amplified and not necessarily them being well-rounded, but that they have really strong strengths that if they need something, they can go to that person for. So lean on those strengths and double down on them. Um, and, uh, and I've learned most just through my career is grinding isn't sustainable, which just daily waking up from 8 a.m. to 1 a.m. in the morning and just working 
all day long, nonstop, isn't isn't sustainable. Um, and it's certainly a wreck on your emotional uh, well-being. And so I would say just just focus on again that priority. Like the priority is is such a key that how you start your day, how you lay out your list of to-dos every day, how you end your day with making sure that you're prepared for the next day. It's just being intent, how that uh, you're intentful in, in your purpose in your day will drive your productivity and the ability for you to cut your times from nine to five or from nine to eight, whatever, whatever you feel comfortable working in. But those would kind of be my, my big learning lessons that I myself have just absolutely struggled through and had to learn the hard way that those are the, the, the ways to really grow as a, as a leader. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I very much agree, uh, with your comments about, uh, people, uh, my very first corporate mentor, his name was Pat Hickey. Uh, and uh, we worked at a couple different companies together. And I remember we were at an event and he just, um, said to me that, you know, there was so much complexity going on and there was a strategy and this and that it was, there was so many things swirling. And I remember him looking at me and he just said, you know, just remember business is all about people. And, and when you, when you distill it down to that, where it's business is just all about people. And then that means it's all about relationships. It's all about connecting. It's all about talking and communicating and understanding. It's not us versus them. It's not, you know, sales versus marketing. It's not marketing versus production. It's not whatever. It's, it's all about people. And that's all an, or, an organization is. It's just this compilation of, of highly skilled individuals combined for a total vision and, and mission of that organization. And so that was one of those sort of epiphany moments for me of just remember it is, it is just about people. So the example that you mentioned about Jeff, your CEO, that, you know, that human touch of, you know, handwritten letters and connecting with people and knowing people's names. And, you know, it just can't be overstated the value of that. So I appreciate you sharing that. It means everything. I totally agree with you, Glenn. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, a while back, I know that you, you know, talking about a little bit about a praise here, uh, you were a nominee for the Philadelphia Business Journal's 40 Under 40 list. So that's awesome. Congratulations. That is an awesome Thanks. honor. So I appreciate that. Yeah. So congratulations. And so, but now <laughs> what do you see as the next opportunity or the next challenge that you want to tackle in, in your career? I have two. I have, uh, I have a personal challenge to myself and I have uh, what I want medical guardian. I've always wanted medical guardian to become um, my personal one is I've, I, I, I want to be a, a CEO, whether it's medical guardian, CEO, or a CEO eventually of my own company that I established after my time at medical guardian. Um, I want to make the decisions. I want to make the calls. I want to be able to establish the mission, uh, the drive. Um, and I, I've just had, as I'm learning more about, and I've always put the things that I read are because I, I want to know, I want to know everything about the business. I ask questions. I've been meeting with our uh, CFO um, weekly for one of my personal goals is just to, to learn financial education, just to go through the process, his thought process, have how he thinks about the business, hear from him. Um, I love just listening to other department heads and just understanding how they think about that business. Maybe not the very detailed part of it, but just at the high level, um, it really, it, um, just hearing from them drives kind of my, my, um, my ability to kind of push the things that I need to do forward. So I would say BCO is kind of the, my, my future goal here. And then for the company, it's, uh, and I've, I've been saying it like a mantra, like a meditation mantra, uh, for the last five years, I think people are getting annoyed with me, but it's be, to become the number one, uh, senior focused healthcare company in the country. And we, I started saying that when we didn't even have a, healthcare portion of, of our business. It was just a small DTC business. Um, and now we've established an acquisition, which puts us at the top of, of the healthcare side of the world. Uh, we're starting to move into different technologies that are really about protecting people in their home for longer and proactively tracking their health. So it's very much so becoming a reality. I don't know if I spoke it into existence or if it's just happening naturally, because that's kind of the direction and path that we could take. But it's exciting to see it progress that way. 
Um, because I just think it's such a, it's such an empowering thing to be able to help somebody, especially now with all the things that we've experienced in the last three to four years is how do you live in your home longer? How do you be protected longer? How do you be more, more proactive about your health? It's so hard. We are reactive in nature. All humans are typically reactive in nature. How do we get people to be proactive, to make it fun, to track your health, to make it empowering, to know that about yourself, to make it easier to access care, uh, and then to make it easier to monitor and track and pass that information along to your family members, your friends, neighbors, whomever you need to, to to make sure that you're successfully aging in our tagline, a life without limits. So removing those bar- barriers, making it about living life, not about all these little nuances that make life typically difficult. Mm-hmm. Well, and when you mentioned, you know, I'm not sure if I manifested that into, into reality or not, you know, I, I, one of my favorite authors, Dr. Wayne Dyer, uh, passed away several years ago, but, uh, his book, the power of intention, uh, you know, it's, you know, sometimes you just need to intend, uh, that something is going to happen. You, you know, that, that thought, that direction, you're aligning everything towards a specific direction and, uh, and things can manifest, uh, you know, in, in, in that direction. So I think that's great. Uh, and I, I like how, you know, you're sort of uh, on one hand, the, repositioning, uh, you know, of the organization, of the product lines, et cetera, but, but also, you know, focusing on a larger vision, uh, you know, that it's not just necessarily a product, but it is, it is what the product can actually do, uh, you know, for the customers. Um, so, you know, and so, and you mentioned at Medical Garden, you're obviously really focused on redefining medical care and medical care assistance. Um, so would you say that there are, you know, important components of that, uh, of the customer? Customer experience and uh, and and if so, what what would you say those are? Well, I, it's been my <laughs> it's been my last uh, two years of trying to learn that process, which is th- there are a couple of things that we've broken down into now. Uh, it, it's really on there's an AI side of this whole world, right? Is personalized, truly personalizing it on every person. Um, I think that's an advanced level. I think starting out is just just being a good listener. People that are really good at listening uh, understand more. They talk less. They listen more. And they're better at positioning things for those, those personas, those segments, those groups. Um, whether that be a survey, whether that be not fearing the – really negative reviews that are coming through, turning it off and dialing that down. Just, I would say, turn it the opposite way. Listen as much as you can. The key is to reduce that noise by action, not to ignore that noise. Um, and I think that just comes with caring. Uh, usually more thoughtful, better listener, people who care more, want to help solve problems. Um, it's really easy to block it out because as you grow, it becomes more about the bottom line. It becomes more about the dollars, the budget, hitting your goals. But uh, I'm also reading a, a book right now, um, Broken Windows, uh, and the whole the whole thought process is that, um, and it, it was more specifically to crime and Mayor Giuliani when when he was trying to help fix or upgrade New York was really just about not starting at the big keeping things that were right in front of him was really go down to the, even the most granular level of in the poor neighborhoods, fixing windows. And if you're seeing a window that's clean and new and fixed instead of a broken window, you start to monitor and say, well, what else are they looking at? If they're looking at these windows. So it really puts into your mind mindset that like people care about the little things, um, getting their name right. Like you mentioned, or how you personalize it towards them. How do you cater that information to them? Uh, and then I mentioned two things. So when you start getting into the AI, it's really like the, the micro culture of moments, those little moments in time. And this is kind of how I feel about being in the office as opposed to being more digital is you don't get a lot of those those little micro culture, those little tiny moments where the real big ideas start to form and snowball um, because you're just riffing. You're just going back and forth, not necessarily talking business, not on a business call where you just have to talk about that one thing, but you're just connecting as people. And I think that's where really a lot of the value uh, in business and a lot of value, value in life comes from is just connecting with people. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and that's how you create a really great story mission and, and uh, connects your audience the most is you got a person, you have to have a personalized touch. You have to care. Yeah. Yeah. W- well said. Uh, and, and so, and I want to, I want to focus in on one thing when you're talking a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the medical care assistance and, and, uh, sort of, you know, how the customer experiences that. Um, and there's a product that you have, uh, that I want to actually, uh, just dig into a little bit. And I believe, uh, it's the MG move. Uh, it's the smartwatch. Uh, and it's this new technical assistance tool um, from Medical Guardian. And so I was curious if you could just talk a little bit about, you know, how you sort of went about creating that, um, you know, not being too dec- uh, technical for the demographic, um, you know, customer studies, et cetera. It's just a really interesting, uh, you know, uh, product set. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we, we really wanted to produce uh, the key to this whole thing is the the market is severely underpenetrated in the medical alert space, uh, primarily due to the fact that historically there's been a stigma around it. Um, it's been painted as something that's for old people, something for fragile people, um, and so ever since the start of our rebrand, which you know the new logo, the new tagline, um, the new mission statement, how we positioned individual older adults on our website, not saying senior, not saying senior citizen, really saying aging adults, active adults, um, has been about uh, how do we create something that is simple, easy to use, um, less of distraction, more of living. Uh, you ha- you want to have it with you and you want it to, to be there for when you need it, but you're not engaging with it all the time. The key is to not flip through it. Even I'm, I'm wearing an Apple watch now, but even me, I get vibrations, notifications. It, for a person who's aging, uh, it, I think it's, and anyone really, it, it just becomes about more about living life, less about worrying about things. And so we just wanted to create something that was simple, easy to use, something that they could still connect with their loved ones, because that's really what's about social connection um, something to help remove the, uh, the things that drive decline in health, um, and adding to the value of their life. Um, if it is reminders, how do we do it in a clever way to which it's not overly distracting, but it's going to help them. Uh, if we are going to connect with the caregiver through voice, how is it going to be easiest? How is it going to be easy to read? Uh, when something pops on the screen, is it going to be large? Can you increase the font? Um, so really just thinking through, and we always get the comparison is, is how, you know, are you competing against the Apple watch? Are you competing against? And the answer is no, because we're not trying to be, uh, sexy or sleek. We're just trying to create a product that is going to empower these individuals to wear it, be proud of wearing it and want to feel good about being protected we found that if people aren't wearing these, typically what happens is they start to decline in health just because they start fearing doing things. They stop exercising. They stop going for jogging. They stop getting on a step ladder and reaching for things around the house or cleaning and sweeping and going up and down the stairs. So now they're only sleeping on the first floor. Like They start to fear those things, and then that becomes a detriment. Mm-hmm. And then the, slowly the decline happens. Mm-hmm. And so really all of our products, including the MG Move, has just been about – How can we get them sleeker? How can we get them sexier? How can we get them more lightweight, more discreet? So it just, it's not about that device. You can put it on your shirt if you need to, put it under your your sleeve if you need to, but you know it's there Mm -hmm. and you, and you, and you feel that empowerment of having that as your backup. Yeah. There's a reassurance there, protect a sense of protection and. 100%. 100%. And not only for the, the person wearing it, it's for the people that are caring for them. Uh, it becomes just a daily just worry we've heard from caregivers they're just so worried about their loved ones every day and then it almost becomes the the, that the older adult feels like they're a burden because like i don't need you worrying about me all day long i want you to work but i you know i can't help it you're my mom you're my dad you're my uncle whatever you're my relative of some sort and i love you and i and i care about you and i worry about you having these falls and, and incidents um so it's just been about peace of mind And how do we remove limitations? Life Without Limits, I think, is perfect because barriers continue to be put up as you age. 
one barrier after the next after the next they stack up and so what we're trying to do is just chip away you know it's not like this overarching you're never going to have limits in your life life without limits is more of a of a way of thinking to you don't have to have these barriers you can chip them away we and let us be there for you as you experience that and try to figure out how we can do that together yeah yeah very much a partner a partner in that journey that's yeah. right excellent Matthew, before we wrap up today's episode, what is the main takeaway that you want to leave our audience with in understanding the challenges facing marketing operations executives today? I think the main takeaway for me is is to embrace change, is to not be afraid to fail, is uh, focus on your priorities and and know that potentially what got you to a certain place isn't going to get you the next. So always be willing to learn, absorb, um, and think through the fact that people and learning and engaging with people is, is going to, is what makes it satisfying to do the job in the first place. So make it, if you're going to do something, make it surrounded around people, helping people, engaging with people, um, cause that's, what's going to drive the satisfaction of continuing to do it over and over again. Hmm. Excellent. Well, we'll leave it right there. This wraps up this episode of the art of marketing operations. Thank you so much for joining us today, Matthew. Thank you, Glenn. I appreciate you having me. Absolutely. Well, until next time, stay safe, take care, and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to The Art of Marketing Operations, brought to you by Taylor. Don't forget to hit subscribe in your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, review, and share. Until next time.